Good evening everyone my name is Paul Young and I'm doing a series of um, videos just to highlight key aspects of policies and just overall the flow of government as we build up to the election and election in October of this year. And one of the areas that comes up constantly is the NDP is bringing up fiscal management. Now they basically have, they're drawing on different factors in there. First of all we should set the record straight. The NDP has never ruled at a federal level and ruling at a federal level is much different than a provincial level. You get more involved with foreign policy. It's more about setting trade and tax policies at a federal level that dictate how business investments going to kind of flow through to down to the provinces. So typically when you have too much intervention to an economy and that's typically the NDP's philosophy is where they want to control who enters the market you typically put restrictions on that capital coming in and it actually kind of hurts the economy because Canada is only a population of about 36 million people it it really needs foreign direct investment in order for it to flourish in terms of its development of its resources expansion of plants uh, any sort of type of infrastructure in Involvement as well. It all relies on a certain amount of foreign capital. You'll never hear that statement from the NDP because they typically do not understand how foreign markets work. They typically think they can manage things at their level in their little island. And that's typically the response that you're going to hear from Thomas Mulcair. He never really talks any details. He's, he, typically, he panders for votes. That kind of sets the table to what I want to discuss. Now, let's really talk about who the new Democratic Party is. Look at their ties. They're tied back to basically Saskatchewan deep roots. That's why most of the time when you hear about fiscal management and possibilities, they tie it back to Tommy Douglas and all that. He had a role to play, and I'm not underselling that, and he did a great job with universal health care. But this is not the 1960s. Globalization was non-existent in the 1960s. Um, we had different issues we were faced in there. We started looking at retirement in terms of the CPP and stuff in OAS started looking at different programs as that we were just coming out of the the war the last uh, 15 years as part of a huge boom cycle in terms of building infrastructure and all that so it was a completely different era to where we are now so that's why to me as much as Thomas Mulcair likes to talk about things he's talking about things in ancient history not in the reality of the last 10 years why because he's trying to sell himself that the NDP are fiscal managers and in essence he's trying to put the wool over people's eyes and really you guys need the, the people that are watching these videos and need to take a take on this guy to see the reality about him and that's what I want to kind of lead into here if you look at this here too he's tied to the Canadian Labour Congress because the roots of the NDP go back to the CLC so it's not surprising when you see analysis or information coming from Mulcair that's almost stamped directly from the Canadian Labour Congress, he still probably uses them as terms of his facts or research. And I'll give you a good example of this and it ties into where you'll see it. He basically it said he wants to raise the minimum wage for federal employees. Now, that's a, a misnomer because it only really impacts people that are in federal regulated businesses. Now, guess who used the, he used to do the survey there? He used the CLC. Uh, I did some research and I found out that he basically used their research to kind of vet the numbers. Well, Stats Canada doesn't track numbers down uh, to that granularity term, in terms of what businesses are federal regulated or not. However, there's a different bunch of surveys and I looked at five different articles and input there's no way there's going to be a hundred thousand jobs impacted because most cases government jobs pay pretty well so there's not a lot of people that would be impacted by minimum wage but it's a sell job that he's trying to show he cares I wanted to tie that into it because that ties into the Canadian Labor Congress let's also talk a bit about their policies right and this is a good example of it they are for social security and social services and there's nothing wrong with that but their philosophy is social services at all costs. They, they believe social services should drive the economy, not the private sector. So that's why typically with NDP governments, you usually see higher taxes, higher user fees, because they believe you want to pay for more to get more in return. They don't care what it does in terms of the cost competitiveness of a province, or a con well, and I can't say a country because they've never been there before, but you need to understand that in terms of looking at things, right? Let's talk about foreign policy. The NDP's only view of foreign policy is the UN. They've never supported NATO or NORAD or any sort of military intervention. It's not, the, it's not in their demeanor. So if you hear Thomas Mulcair talking about military investments, 
or support for the vets it's just smoke and mirrors because typically the NDP doesn't support anybody other than what the UN tells them to do and that goes back to their roots you gotta remember who their party mem members are they're activists they're union reps they're young kids they're people that are fanaticals in certain things in terms of policy they're not necessarily live in reality or do they care they're basically to push a social agenda as we call uh, the UN's got agenda agenda 21 which means they're pushing green energy pushing everything to get away from carbon based economies right that's the, the reason why you're seeing a lot of their statements on basically green technology so you should be cognizant of that fact when you hear about um, UN 21 because that's a movement that's very dangerous for a country like Canada when we, we rely on development of resources let's talk about trade Canada relies significantly on foreign trade investments and business deals as I mentioned earlier we rely on a lot of that in terms of foreign direct investment to help develop the resources whether it's the oil sands whether it's mineral deposits whether it's automotive sector in terms of manufacturing whether it's food processing whatever you need we need that investment that hard capital coming in we also need to have access to markets the NDP seems to put their turn their nose up anytime you see about free trade agreements they seem to not agree with them their philosophy I believe is coming from the uniform and their union background that they believe people will move company jobs outside and they believe unions are just afraid of competing so they want to have more protectionism policies because the unions won't work work on a lot of cases on automation or anything to help companies become more competitive so they will fight trade deals they haven't supported anything that Stephen Harper has done whether it's the FIPA which is the F investment agreement with China they don't support any sort of deals with Colombia South Korea or SETA they have basically against that but sometimes it's funny because you listen to Don Davies speak who's their uh, critic for trade and he gives you inconsistent statements he actually says he talks about trade imbalances uh, that Canada has but really what a trade imbalance is is between its difference between exports and imports so if you're got a negative imbalance that means you're importing more than you're exporting well how are you gonna expand exports you think people are gonna want to buy or manufacture finished goods we don't like we don't make TVs here anymore you know we don't make cell phones so how are you going to expand trade imbalances? Well, you're going to have to go into advanced manufacturing, get into aerospace. You're going to have to get into agricultural shipments. You have to get into um, forestry. You're going to have to look at the, how you develop the resources and some advanced type of finished goods. But you don't hear that for the NDP because they don't necessarily talk about the details because it's easier to slam the messenger than it is the details. Let's talk about provincial governments. The NDP puts up this big graph and says, it compared the liberals, compared the Indi the conservatives, and they compared the themselves, the NDP, in terms of fiscal management and graphs. Now, let's look at facts here. Okay, in the history of Canada, the NDPs predominantly ruled BC, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. They've had chances in Ontario in the early 90s. They've had chances in Nova Scotia as well. They have never been in power till recently in Alberta, till Rachel Notley got elected. They've never been in Quebec. New Brunswick's never had them. Newfoundland's never had them. PEI's never had them. So when they quote things, you need to quote things in perspective. They've been focusing on areas like Saskatchewan is their roots. It makes sense why they had a, an NDP government. Manitoba is connected to Saskatchewan, so they've got probably pretty good connection and probably similar economies. They're agricultural. And agricultural base that's where the NDP's roots came out of BC is a funny province because it's it I think it has a lot to do with the way Vancouver and Victoria it's the urban versus the rural areas and that's where you see the NDP is strong and basically just the type of demographic shift that's out in BC you see that but recently basically the Liberal government is now in, uh, in power in BC uh, Brad Wall in Saskatchewan, he's more liberal conservative. He's not an NDP person. He's called, called the Saskatchewan Party. It's probably more progressive than it is liberal. So there's only one provincial government now that's NDP. And let's talk about things right now. Okay. Now, with the NDP itself, they tend to avoid... Thomas Mulcair tends to avoid having any discussion of negativity around NDP parties. 
Let's talk about a diversified province, Ontario. Ontario is a good measuring stick about how Canada would operate under an NTP government. Why do you say that? Because it's got automotive, it's got forestry, it's got mining, we refine products here, it's got green energy, and it's got home to a population of over, over 12, 13 million people. It's also very connected and dependent on foreign trade and exports to the U.S. where it basically benefits from NAFTA. The reason why I use Canada is in the early 90s people got fed up in a protest vote. They had no confidence in the Conservative Party anymore. Uh, David Peterson was a nightmare when he was in the Liberal Party. So people did a protest vote and bo voted in Bob Ray. Bob Ray's pe candidates were union people, young people, no real world experience. He, his, his, his Minister of Finance was a farmer slash economist because he had no other person to do it. So that tells you a bit about the roots of Bob Ray and how it winds up in Ontario. Now, what Bob Ray decided to do, in 1991 we had a recession in Ontario, okay? And it was a big, a, a bad recession, right? So Bob Ray came in during the recession, right? What Bob Ray decided to do is he decided to spend his way out of a recession. So he rolled up some of the highest level of deficits in Ontario history. The only person that's matched those deficits is Kathleen Wynne and Dalton McGinty. Okay, so put that in the frame. The other thing that he did in power is he raised business taxes, he raised um, personal taxes, and he basically brought in anti-scab legislation. He made it so unfriendly for Ontario to do business in that it set it back at least a decade before business was really confident they could deal with him. Now that, those are the things that you do not hear. What you do hear is that, well, he came in in a recession. There's things that you do in a recession. One of the things you don't do is you don't raise income taxes. You also get more strategic in terms of how you put the, the flow of cash into the economy to support the private sector growth. But you're talking the NDP. Their skill set in economics is not that. They threw money at everything, and that's the issues you've seen in there. The other thing is, the two worst negative growth periods in Ontario's history were 1995 under Bob Ray and from 2000 to 2010 which the bulk of that was under the Liberal Party. Now let's take a step back here. In the periods of growth, yes we had strong economic growth in Ontario from 95 to about 2001, but we had a good base in there. We had low hydro rates, we had competitiveness and productivity at our manufacturing facilities, we had a government that was working with business. Okay. Yes, there were some cutbacks that the provinces faced due to austerity measures by the Liberal government, but Mike Harris in general dealt with them. Was it perfectly dealt? No. Some decisions were made that probably weren't made properly, but if you look through history, all governments have made decisions and choices. Now, I just want to illustrate Bob Ray because Thomas Mulcair never talks about Bob Ray in Ontario. Why? Because they were abject failure. And when you're an abject failure, why would you run on that? You're going to run on people like the Saskatchewan or Manitoba under Gary Doerr because they show prudence in terms of how they handle the economy and a bit of the, some of the programs. But he will never talk about details. Let's talk about Nova Scotia. They, they, they also decided, you know what? I'm done with the Liberals. I'm done with the Conservative. I'm going to elect Daryl Dexter. Look at what happened when he took office. Yes, we were part of a recession there, but he ran multi-million dollar deficit, multi-hundred million dollar deficits. The other thing is, he did some significant issues. One, he negotiated with the nurses and basically gave them a raise, hired them what they wanted. So that put pressure on health care dollars. He then made some decisions to support businesses that were failing, like a bull water pulp and paper mill. But it went under it anyways. So the NDP brought in policies that didn't really help business and eventually led to higher hydro rates which Nova Scotia is up there with Ontario with hydro rates. So if you're looking at an NDP government you're looking at slowly more money and more taxation but you're also looking at aspects of government that basically won't drive business investment. Why does he not talk about Daryl Dexter? Again, he's an abject failure. Why would you talk about an abject failure with a government when basically you're trying to win office to show that you're prudent, that you've got solid fiscal policies. 
Let's talk about British Columbia now. Now, look at British Columbia. The bulk of the time since 95, they've run deficits. Okay? Guess who was in the power when they were running those deficits? The NDP. Okay? You cannot lose sight of BT's dynamics. Okay? Since Gordon Campbell and eventually Christy Clark took office, who are liberal connected, there's been an opening up of the resource sector in BC. And that means, for example, one of the areas that Christy Clark is working on is liquid natural gas. Liquid natural gas is key because company, uh, countries like Malaysia, Japan want to get away from nuclear power and to get into more natural gas filing, uh, plants. So there's a big push to export there. Now, it's dropped out, well, dropped back a bit because the natural gas pricing's come down. But the aspect is liquid natural gas is a key area which Christy Clark worked with Prime Minister Harper to come up with a new policy to support that industry. If you elect an NDP government, they're not resource-based. They do not care about natural resources. And you'll hear inconsistent statements. Mr. Mulcair will say, we want sustainable practices with managing natural resources. Yet, people within his party, which are some of them are in BC, have actually come out and say some of the oil and gas should stay in the ground. Or, I'm against pipelines. Well, how do you bring up exports to reduce that trade imbalances if you're not using natural gas or oil to be part of that solution? So you could talk about trade imbalances all you want, but if you're not going to make natural resources a critical platform, is this a party you want to elect in office? That's something you have to ask. And if I was in BC, I'd be taking a step back and say, I want economic growth. And I'll give you another example here. Prince Rupert has the potential to be a large size port to help with exports. Nathan Cohn is in that writing. He says nothing about the work that the federal government has done in terms of development, the resource market, as well as that port for expansion. They've provided money. No comment from Cohn. Why? Because they're trying to play to do all this pandering to votes. The other thing is they do not talk enough about the pressures on small business. Okay? In BC's case, they introduced the carbon pricing model. Now, that pushed enough cost push cost up to the system so how Christy Clark and Gordon Campbell handle that is they brought in tax cuts now they didn't offset everything but they've kind of moved that direction that's why their economy is more is moved into aerospace moved in information technology they've really gone solid in the Okanagan Valley with agriculture so they've tried to diversify their economy they're in situation right now this year that their manufacturing sales in Canada will be the top and that's that's going good with a liberal government that's running it that gets it about policy. The previous NDP governments did not get it about policy there. Now if you're thinking about electing an NDP government, you should be thinking about how they've been successful, not just on the finances, about how they've been able to manage the economy and also provide social programs because you have to have the right mix. Now the next thing I want to talk about is Saskatchewan. Now Saskatchewan makes sense why they've had the bulk of basically the bulk of the, the time they they have the bulk of the basically the time they've been in power uh, because again we trace the NDP roots back to Saskatchewan. And that's why you see here different aspects of it. But what you have to look at is a transformation of the economy in Saskatchewan. When the NDP typically has been in power, they mostly were agricultural based and with some focus on potash and some other mining resource areas. But that was very little of the economy. It was pretty well driven by the farmers. So it makes sense in terms of when you look at the economic base of how they were able to have surpluses there because of the nature of the way the economy and the agriculture se sector works basically because people need to eat so we had good shipments and exports of wheat rye barley and all that canola so we was able to help the Saskatchewan the economy Brad Wall came into power and wanted to put more emphasis on 
both different aspects of policy. A, he wanted to social, support social programs. He wanted to build more education and healthcare. And he also wanted to add the ability to do more manufacturing. Diversify the economy in general is what he wanted to do. And that's what Brad Wall has done since he took office. By far, he's the best premier probably in Canada. And I would say in all the years I've followed government, I would have to rank him as one of the best premiers I've ever seen in office. He gets it about the balanced approach. What you do not hear from Thomas Mulcair is how Saskatchewan's economy has diversified over the years since the NDP has left office. He's pretty good at taunting them to basically say, you know what, they were good, they balanced budgets, they ran surpluses. But running a surplus, as I've talked to before in previous recordings, doesn't mean anything if the money doesn't flow back through into social services or into basically tax cuts to help the low-income, the middle-income Canadians and people of the province. Let's talk about Manitoba now. He talks about Gary Dore. He talks about Gary Philman. They were successful in running some def uh, surpluses. What he doesn't talk is Greg Selinger. Greg Selinger has raised taxes there. He's raised the PST in Manitoba. He's basically got the worst health care system in, the, in Canada in terms of delivery. He got a D rating. He's got uh, a downgrade from Moody's in terms of his debt to GDP. And yet, Mulcair says Manitoba's great, been won efficiently by the NDP. But he doesn't talk about Greg Selinger. So it's easy to run as a government and to run on your history. But this is not about history anymore. This is about the facts it's going to take you to become successful. The core roots of Thomas Mulcair's programs and policies are still deep-rooted to the core values of that party in the 1960s. No NATO involvement, foreign ownership restrictions. So he's not outward in thinking. The same stuff he criticizes Stephen Harper on is the stuff that's going to take Canada back 10 years if you elect an NDP government. Because these NDP governments are not about anything about other than they're in control of everything. Now, let's take a step back. All these provinces, based on the Constitution, have the ability to manage their natural resources. It's part of the Constitution. Mulcair, is not, Mulcair knows that's the case. What he will do is bring policy in to force them to relook and rethink how they do things. So how is that going to help by changing and making it more difficult to extract and refine resources, even whether it's upstream or downstream from those flows, how is that going to help the economy? How is that going to help reduce the trade imbalance? Where is he going to make up this 8 to the $9 billion difference between exports and imports if we do not look at key sectors like energy, key sectors like agriculture? He basically talks about wheat boards. He talks about different things. But some of these boards were never successful in their bureaucracy to help support exports. As you start reading through the election platforms and the policy, it's really incumbent on you to kind of take a holistic view of these policies. Don't take me at face value. Go out and read and research what CLC says. Go read and research what the Canadian Federation of Independent Business says. Go research what Canadian Manufacturer Association says. Go look what other countries say in terms of our middle class. This is not about me just splaring off on these videos. What it's about you guys to do and the people that watch these videos is to go out, listen, read, ask questions of these people running for power. Try to get beyond the BS and pandering that they're doing to the actual solid policies. Take a look at your family. You could be a student. You could be somebody that's going into the trades. You could be a teacher. You could be a lawyer. You could be working in public safety. You could be in a manufacturing operation. You could be an engineer. You could be working in municipalities. What you want to do is, what government's going to help me overall move my country forward to help support it? It's not just about raising taxes, and that's what you're hearing from Thomas Mulcair. Now, he's backpedaled a little bit, but he's got about $10 billion sitting in his platform. He said he won't run deficits. Well, the bulk of spending in any turn in government's budget is in three or four key areas. It's transfers, it's OAS, Ontario, um, not Ontario, old age security. It's also in basically EI programs. Those are the big programs. So where are you going to cut that? Direct program spending only accounts for about $80 billion of the government's budget. Okay? There is not, are you going to take $10 billion all that? Are you going to fire employees? He says he's not going to do that. 
So what is he going to do in terms of his tax policies and his program spending to make sure that we don't go into deficits? He's criticized Harper since 2008 to 2009 of running successive years deficits. What he doesn't say, he doesn't have a plan. And that's what you should be asking yourself. How valid is what he's saying to you going to fall into a plan that's going to take it? You already know basically what the liberals are. They're prepared to run deficits up to 2019. The same deficits they criticize Stephen Harper on, they want to run. It's up to you guys and people to kind of do your research. Thank you.